Pastor Chaz. My jokes are wasted, I reckon. Um, how are we all today? We're all good? Having a good day? I've got all the kids back at Sunday school, which is good, and Bible class and a crash. Um, so come on down. We're going to go to Hebrews in chapter 11. If you're visiting here for the first time or you've been looking to uh, find out whether all this is true, hopefully today this might be your, your day of salvation. Um, if you're at home watching, you've been motivated to watch today, to see and hear already the testimonies of in the chorus time. We're going to give you an opportunity to get baptised too. There's the curtain, uh, behind the curtain there's a baptism tank and we're going to uh, give you opportunity a little bit later on today after the communion service uh, for you to be baptised and uh, we, we can pray with you to receive the Holy Ghost. We can have uh, prayer for you to be healed. Whatever is in your um, corner of your life, we know that God is able to help you out right now today. And I want to talk about faith. So we're going to go to Hebrews in chapter 11, if we can. Hebrews in chapter 11. So, faith. It's an interesting word, isn't it? We don't want to complicate the word faith. Uh, if we have to look it up in the dictionary, that's one thing, probably to expound it. It means, uh, amongst other things, to have trust. It means to uh, believe, have confidence. The Lord talks about having confidence in the Lord. Uh, faith, right now we're demonstrating it. Every time you sit on a seat, in a, in a natural example, Hebrews in chapter 11 says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for. Before you sit down, you want to be confident that your weight is not going to destroy the chair that you're sitting on. <laughs> and so far, so good. No one's broken through a chair, although it can happen on those plastic ones. So you believe, you trust, and you have confidence that when you sit down, that chair is going to support your weight. And there's the other part, for the evidence of things not seen. When you go to your home and you turn the light switch on, you have every expectation that the switch will operate the light and you'll be able to see when you use the remote control. There's, um, you don't know how it works, but you know that it's going to work. You have faith, you have trust, you have belief and confidence is going to work and you put your music on or whatever you've got to do, your alarm clock, your phone, is it on the whole aspects of faith in application using these things as an example that you might be able to relate it to your life if you're visiting here uh, for the first time. Let's look firstly, we've got that part there, faith is the substance of things hoped for, evidence of things not seen. So we know that even with this microphone, oh, we know electronically it works, but the mechanisms to make it work and for people to be at home watching from live stream there's an element of faith that's required. There's substance of things hoped for that today, when you turned the computer on at 1.30, that you believed, you trusted and you relied that it was going to be operational. And we know by that red and green light that it is working right now. And there's evidence now that it's working today. And we're looking at our Bibles about faith. We're going to look further afield and look at what God says about faith as well as we go to Deuteronomy in chapter 7. Deuteronomy chapter 7. So you've applied faith spiritually to come here today. There's a hope that maybe this might be an answer in your life. There is a hope that, that God will accept you, even though you're a sinner. There's a hope that somehow you might walk out here today knowing that God is real. Because you can't see God. There's no evidence in the sense of your life. So that you've applied faith to come here this afternoon to view and to hear about God's people talking and testifying about the reality of what they know to be true in their life. We heard the two testimonies here already this afternoon and the chorus time of God working in people's lives. Miracle. And I wonder what would happen in the world today, or just thinking about uh, Brother Andrew there, if there was a, a law that went out to, today saying that from midnight tonight it will be against the law 
to baptize people. I wonder how many people would reverse and go, you've got no right to tell me that. And they'd be marching down here because it's their right to be baptized. But because uh, baptism is a free will choice, baptism requires your, your faith too to believe that God is going to meet you in the waters of baptism and in being filled with the Holy Ghost, salvation we call it. That without you living this life, uh, without any aspect or hope of salvation, the Bible declares that we are men most miserable if we don't believe in the resurrection life of, of uh, Jesus Christ or that he's coming back again for his people. If we lived in this auditorium and we didn't believe that Jesus was coming again for his own, it, it, this wouldn't hold us. I wouldn't hold you. And no other preacher, however fanciful their words would be, would not hold you to stay here year in and year out. Something holds us here to come back each week and through the middle of the week and we go through our week and we talk to people at work, as Tony was mentioning a moment ago. What drives us to be persuaded, convinced, confident and trusting that we know that when we speak about God we somehow know that God is with us and when we talk to people our ears prick up when we hear of a person who's got a need uh, at work at school wherever we might be we overhear a conversation and immediately we're drawn to a thought the Lord can help that person because we have confidence and faith to know that God works in people's lives. In Deuteronomy chapter 7, it says here to the, in the Old Testament, Know therefore that the Lord thy God, he is God, the faithful God, which keepeth covenant and mercy with them. Deuteronomy chapter 7 verse 9, keep covenant and mercy with them that loveth him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations thousand generations where God is bringing in this thought here today that love and faith work together and I would like to put a, a question to our brothers and sisters that maybe natural brothers and sisters that have just come in today of planet earth um, you're from a natural point of view you're we're we're all of the same flesh. We've been made after the similitude of God. If you've come here today with a little bit of faith, and the Bible here says it's mercy and love combined together, faith and love work together with mercy, then if, if Christ says in the New Testament that they that love me keep my commandments... And you've come here today and you want to demonstrate your determination to want to love God, then that starts in the waters of baptism here this afternoon. And if you say no, I don't want to be baptized today, then oh, I've got a question I want to put to you. If Christ so loved the world, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that who would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life, what wrong has Christ? ever done to you what wrong what what horrible thing has Jesus Christ ever done to you that you would not want to be obedient to his calling what what horrible thing has he ever said to you that would warrant you to not respect and, and to want to love him and to show some form of faith toward him what has he done wrong to your soul that you would say no way am I ever going to get baptized and be filled with the Holy Ghost when he offers not just faith he offers mercy, which we need, and he offers his love, his, his, his proof of love that he allowed his son to die on the cross at Calvary so that you and I could be able to have an opportunity of salvation. And if we say no to being baptised, if we say no to um, anything that he's offering us, we're really saying no to salvation, eternal life, healings miracles that can happen in our life and we've got Christ beckoning saying well give me a chance just give me a chance I'll, I'll prove myself to you if you come to me so faith has helped you here 
and maybe it'll get you through to the waters of baptism and then his love for you will be insurmountable it's magnificent it will prove itself to you he'll fill you with the holy ghost and you walk out of here brand new person brand new never never done wrong because the lord will raise out of your life all the horrible things that have happened in your life and that's what we need we need that in our life we need salvation um I've been in the fellowship coming up to 40 years. Uh, not one of my members of my family have come along. Uh, they've all been healed. Uh, my brother was unable to have children with his wife. And uh, we, there was a, I was at a family do. And my a youngest sister, I've said before, but those who don't know, I'm from a family of eight brothers and sisters. So my youngest sister at this family do said she was you'd have a baby well everybody was happy and uh, but my brother he looked I was just looking at the corner in the room and he, oh, he looked really down looked really sad so I went to him afterwards and said look do you mind if my family pray that you might you and your wife might have a child because they'd gone IVF and hadn't worked and a whole lot of things had gone wrong he said oh thanks about 10 weeks later he rang up to tell me that his, him and his wife uh, were going to have a child and he was giving that to the Lord and then um, they have the baby a little while after that and he's on the phone telling me the great news oh that's great James fantastic he's called Luke my nephew Luke well, he might be watching you never know Luke you need to come to the Lord anyway um, so Luke named after from the Bible and then he told me that this is now past experience that he um, they got told that he had lung problems when the baby was born so he went into the woman's children's hospital chapel in North Adelaide and I said oh, okay then and he said oh, no. and I was sitting there and praying and then it lobbed in my head um, I said to God well, whatever happened to my sister-in-law I want to happen to my son and I said what sister-in-law and he said, Christine, your wife, when she was healed as a baby. Now, I'd told him that story would have been, uh, Luke's 18, how long have I been going out with you for, hun? <laughs> 522 years? No. <laughs> 20 years before that. So 20 years, whoever, you can calculate it, he just lay dormant in his mind and his heart. But at the appropriate time, that ping, that little seed of faith came alive. And he remembered the miracle of God working in another person's life. And that miracle, um, he's giving over to the Lord. So we don't know. We ha we're, a, we're a miracle walking people. We, we walk by faith, not by sight. That's what the Lord tells us. And we live faithful lives, as we heard in the testimonies here already. So we live and breathe and emulate faith. It just flows out of us. We don't even feel it, don't even know it, but we do. And people at our work recognize it. And in my brother's hour of need, he saw it there. Now that requires an immense amount of love. Let's read out again in verse 9. Now therefore, uh, know therefore. He's the same yesterday, today, every change is not. So this is for today. Know therefore that the Lord, thy God, he is God. The faithful God, he keepeth covenant and mercy with them that love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. If you want the best from God, obey him. Get baptised today, and he'll prove himself to you. Let's go to um, 1 Corinthians in chapter 13. It's in the same line. 1 Corinthians 13. In the New Testament... But Paul writes to the church at Corinth. He's had a great ex ex infilling himself, Paul, earlier on, and he's instrumental in establishing the church at Corinth and many other places in that period of his life. And he says here in verse 1, Though I speak with tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I'm becoming as a sounding brass, a tinkling cymbal. I don't have any clarity. People don't understand what we're about. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith 
so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. So why am I nothing? Because I'm not doing it with that wonderful faith that the Lord's given to me. He wants me to, and us, to use faith mixed with love and mercy in the way that God has demonstrated to the, to the world. Uh, faith on its own, he created the heavens. We, we read in, in Hebrews that he created the heavens, God himself, and we believe that. But it, we've got God showing to the world his faith and his love and his mercy to mankind through Jesus Christ's life. And Jesus demonstrated time and time again his willingness to bring salvation to people's lives where judgment and all the things that people were trying to catch Jesus out or, or, or to catch other people out and you know, getting Jesus to be the one that would pass judgment on some horrible thing the woman caught in adultery, for example, that we heard here on Wednesday night with uh, Brendan. And, and we want you, Jesus, to demonstrate that punishment on those people. But Jesus resisted that and gave opportunity of salvation for people in that, in that predicament that they might have been in. So no matter what is about your life today, or if you're visiting here or watching, we can prove to you that God is real by our testimony. But more importantly... God can prove himself to you personally. And whatever's in your corner, health-wise, financial, uh, some people come along, they're morally bankrupt. Some people come along, they have religiously persecuted God's people. And they come along and the Lord gives them a brand new start. So if that's your desire, if that's the little bit of faith, that's in your life here today, that somehow you want to just have a fresh start in life, then today is your day of salvation on one condition. Allow his love to bring you to the baptism tank. Because when you do that, he'll prove himself to you time and time again. Let's go to Ephesians in chapter 3. Ephesians in chapter 3. That's why we love talking about the gospel. To, um, we love through the week talking to people about God we love the opportunities that God every day Lord give me an opportunity to talk to someone about you and, and maybe you forget to do that sometimes and we, we all do but if you do do it it's a lovely prayer that God loves to hear if you ask God put me in front of someone that wants to hear the truth he will do that, absolutely. And if you have faith to believe that, absolutely that will happen. And we will continue to grow as a church because our church needs to be driven by faith. Our church needs to be driven by mercy and love. And if we are individuals that have faith, mercy and love, that's good. But as a church, we need to have that as well. We need to be at the front foot of revival. And our world today is going through some horrible horrible things we don't know if it's the beginning but it's it's tough enough as it is and people are searching for a truth the the consumer world has had its day consumerism has not brought peace faith and love into people's lives it brought comfort it's brought them to be in a false sense of security where they can flick the tv on and watch whatever program they so desire in the world you can watch nature programs and you can look at all the awe and wonderful thing of the creation go wow look at that place look at that country look at that animal look at that whatever and be involved at an intricate level of an animal and marvel at the, uh, the photography and we sit there totally at ease wonderfully relaxed but has it brought faith in our life no no it hasn't it's done the exact opposite has it brought forth mercy and love? No, we've just got very comfortable. Bigger, bigger screens, <laughs> um, better colour, better technology that you could 3D and, oh, it's wonderful, no problem. We can watch sport. Whatever your uh, desire is, it's there for you to have. But does it drive you to want to talk to the person who's in desperate need of salvation? No, no, it doesn't do that at all. Does it drive us to want to go down to pray with someone and to see them healed no 
it probably makes us a little bit uncomfortable in that thought of doing that and staying home makes us comfortable when the Lord wants us to be out and about driven by his uh, his love that he demonstrated to the world through Jesus Christ in Ephesians 3 it says here um, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and the length and the depth and the height and to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that you might be filled with all the fullness of God now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us so these are the sort of things that motivate us to go to our Bibles when we're searching for an answer I'm just picking on TV because I happen to have it you know just got one put in there and, and it's a nice screen and it's easy and I'm not condemning it I'm not whatever but I know in me I can watch this movie for two hours and then struggle to pray for 10 minutes sometimes are you the same <laughs> who can put their hand up <laughs> please mercy <laughs> off with his head <laughs> Roman <laughs> take him out um, so we, we, we are motivated by um, when we go out sometimes it's hard but gee when we come back after we've been out and we've visited someone and we've taught the gospel and we've prayed for someone don't we come back feeling different you can go out feeling tired you come back in the worst thing is you're awake and it's 10 o'clock at night it's time for bed but your eyes are, my mind's pinging with the gospel and that's what God wants us to be about not not to be not be driven by an emotional high but to be careful about our hours that we have 168 hours a week how many days we live if you live to 80 times by 365 do yourself a depressing favor <laughs> work out your age minus it off the 80 years if you're lucky pre-adventure and you've got that many days left of your life halve it because there's eight hours of your day you're asleep and you got work and all that reduce it down to the hours that we have to be able to demonstrate what we really like doing which is talking to people about the Lord and when we're at work we respect our bosses and it's hard to do that so we're a, we're a living testimony but to sit down with people and to talk and to show and to share and to show our Bibles that's what we live for and that's what God wants to be living for as well because we're motivated by his love to do that let's go to Luke in chapter 17 Luke 17 I can hear the Sunday school back there <laughs> sounds like a better talk actually when I hear about them Luke 17 Verse 5 of Luke, this is Jesus with his the disciples. And the apostles said unto the Lord, Increase our faith. And the Lord said, If you have faith as a grain of a mustard seed, you might send to the sycamore tree, be thou plucked up by the root, and be thou planted into the sea, and it should obey you. Well, spiritually speaking, well, the seed is one of the smallest seeds planted in the earth. There are smaller seeds, but planted in the earth, the mustard seed is one of the smallest. So the Lord is making you so important to him that he's saying, look, you only need a, a seed of faith to come to me. I'm not going to make this big. I'm going to make this the smallest possible portion of faith that you need to come to me and be baptised and then he gives this example here about the sycamine tree which has got big um, like a mulberry family the fig tree family and they're big roots that go down into the earth and just a strong tree a bit wild looking big branches and bark and all that and it's just a magnificent looking tree and it's just got this really deep root system in the earth and what the Lord is saying here maybe is that if you've got a, a real 
difficulty in your life. This is you who's yet to come to the Lord. Maybe a root of bitterness. Maybe a deep-seated hatred to God or to your fellow man, to your husband, to your wife, to your kids, to whatever, to your work. A deep-rooted issue. The Bible says that little bit of faith will get that thing out of your life. Remove and cast into the sea. We know that trees don't last long in salt water. So he's really saying, come to me and let me sort out the problem in your life. Don't you do it. You can't. It's growing in your life. I remember talking to someone recently about a, a, a root of bitterness. And you can have these little weeds that start up like that big in your garden. It's a weed. But you let it go and it grows and it's tall and it's deep and next thing you need a, a jackhammer or shovel and spade a pick to get that thing right out of the earth to get it out so I was talking to this uh, brother one day and uh, said the great thing about the Lord is when you recognise that you've got a root of bitterness it's no longer, you're no longer blind for starters leading up to it you're not blind at either, but you're blind to the answer. So you seek to justify, as explained to this brother. But when you get to a point where you don't want it in your life and it's deep-seated, the beauty about being in the Lord is the moment you go to the Lord and say, Lord, I don't want that. I don't want to be bitter anymore. Neither do I. Let's get rid of it, shall we? And in a moment of time, with his strength, his power plucks it out of your life. You and I try and do it, we get the jackhammer out. It's a lot of labor, but God wants to do it for us. That's, just, that's what he's there for. And so Jesus is saying here, look, I'll do it all for you. That little bit of seed, that's mustard seed. But then he goes on to say, um, 17, but which of you, continues on, which of you having a servant ploughing or feeding cattle will say unto him by and by, when he has come from the field, go and sit down to meet? Will you not rather say unto him, make ready wherewith I may sup, and gird thyself, and serve me till I have eaten and drunken, and afterward thou shalt eat and drink? Doth he thank the servant, because he had did those things which were commanded him? I try not. I don't think so. So likewise... Ye, when ye shall have done all those things which are commanded of you, say, We are unprofitable servants, we have done that which was our duty to do. It's very interesting the Lord putting this here because he wants to really say, Look, yes, faith is a wonderful thing, but it's also works. We need to just be about God's business. And he's trying to make it a very practical and non-spiritual, mystical thing. It's a very simple process, faith, and now he's bringing this thing about works. Faith and works together. We've got God demonstrating his faith to mankind by love and mercy and faith, and it's the same yesterday, today, and it doesn't change. For you here today that might want to be baptised, or tomorrow, whenever it might be, till the Lord comes back. But he's now saying, Lord, help our faith. First of all, he says, what's a mustard seed? But then he goes on to say, but I'm just going to ask you to do what you need to do. Be about my business. And when he says in Luke 18, when the Lord, the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Um, we're told to labor into the kingdom of God and to continually to work as unto the Lord and labor. So that we're not just sitting down, airy-fairy faith faith and works together we can back this up by james in chapter two if we can go there it's just very interesting how the lord put that in he wanted to bring it down down a peg to planet earth so that you and i would understand the concept that faith needs action working together stepping out in faith doing things for the lord and he says here in chapter two um Verse 17, even so faith, if it has not works, is dead being alone. Yea, a man may say, thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by, thy, by my works. Thou believest, 
that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. But wilt thou know, O man, that faith without works is dead? So we're told here they work together. They work in, in a good, uni united way, in unison, together in their lives. And as you, we as a church, we as individuals are asked to work and plough the fields of our life and to create our own little vineyard in our lives, people that, are, that, have, that are involved in our sphere of life. And what seeds you plant in your own personal vineyard, in your street, in your suburb, in your home, is what God is saying, well, I'm going to give you the ingredients to do that. I'm going to give you the faith and everything that's required for you to have a beautiful vineyard. But if you don't work the work and do the work that I'm doing with together, then um, we really got to be looking at what God, Jesus said there in, 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 back in Luke. He's just saying, well, where's the works? What are we doing? We're just sort of sitting there waiting for the Lord to work for us when he actually t requires us to do things. When I came to the Lord, before I came to the Lord, I was unemployable. I was involved in drugs for a number of years. And um, I was living down at Blue Springs. I should have bought the land, but I, I got offered the land. Now it's worth a lot, so I'm one of those things in life. <laughs> and there was two houses uh, in Blue Moritz Road, beautiful old, still there, went past the other day when we were at Douglas Scrub. Two houses on this hill, I belong to this vineyard. So I came along to the Lord. Um, then within a fortnight, the uh, landowner, De Fabio's down there at McLaren Vale, said, oh, we're, we're, we want the land back. So the two houses, I was living with Pastor Laurie Nankable's brother, Rick. Rick mentioned his brother, Steve, and his sister, I think, Vicky, never once mentioned Pastor Laurie. Laurie didn't exist. Why? Because Pastor Laurie was a Christian. It's only when I came to the Lord at the Easter camp of the year that I came along to the Lord, Pastor Laurie came up. Oh, I could see straight away. He looked like his brother. And I didn't have the heart to say, well, your brother never mentioned you, but I, I just knew. I know why I never mentioned you, because you're a Christian. It's embarrassed sort of stuff. So we all get moved out, and uh, I end up moving down, moving down to Thebiton, the Barton, with a whole lot of brothers there. And the um, next thing, get a job. Before that, the oversight, don't worry about it, Chris, you're just coming along. I came along to the Lord and it was like, get a job, you lazy, you know, sort of thing. Get a job and tithe while you're at it. <laughs> so I came along and uh, we were taught to be industrious, not just to be faithful, hallelujah, boys. And we were told you be a testimony at work. Don't preach in your work hours. Be a living testimony, talk in your lunch break and all that sort of stuff. But talk about the gospel. And so before I got the job, um, this brother said, showed me this scripture. And he said, you've got to work. I said, what does that mean? You know, <laughs> how dare you abuse me? <laughs> anyway, um, get, a, get a job tied to your church if you believe in it so, oh, whatever so then the next day he says you've got to prove yourself to God if you've prayed about it you've got to prove yourself to God and he showed me the scripture faith without works is dead I said what do I got to do he said we've well, got to get out in the street so I packed my bag rucksack bag with food and I walked the streets of Adelaide for three days banging on doors I got abused I got helped People were kind, people were unkind. At the end of that third day, the brother said, well, you prove yourself to God now and read your Bible for the next couple of days because you're going to get a job. You won't, you won't have time to read your Bible when you're working. By the Friday, I had a job. Or by the Monday, I had a job. I went to London with the same principle that oh, I'm going to try that again. I walked the streets of London. Let me take you by the hand. Sorry, song. <laughs> and lead you through the streets of London. You know that one? Well, I didn't sing it, but I walked it. And uh, within three days, did the same thing. The third day, I got ran off sites and all that. And then on the th fourth day, the Thursday, I said, right, okay, God, I've proved m my works. By the Monday, I had a job. So faith without works is dead. If you're looking for a job, get out on the street and door knock, ring up. 
If you're looking for finances, tithe. It works. Faith without works is dead. Prove yourself to be a true servant of God by your works and, and knowing that on God's side, he's demonstrating time and time again what he's prepared to do in your life. If you want salvation today, I'm going to show you right now how you can do it. We're going to Acts chapter 2 verse 38 to finish on. Acts chapter 2 verse 38. This is your bit. You're here today in faith, in works, but you don't have to stop it here, the seat. Will you get up? It's okay, Robin, Phil, you can. You've been baptised <laughs> many, many years ago. I remember when Rob got baptised. Is that right, Rob? <laughs> <laughs> yes, there's a story behind that. Um, so you want to get baptised? You're going to have a communion service. We're going to Acts chapter 2, verse 37. We're going to hear the spiritual gifts where you'll hear tongues, interpretation and prophecy. There'll be an opportunity for you to be baptised. Pastor Paul or Pastor Chasm or Grant will baptise you. There's the changing rooms back here. If you can get changed privately, guys and girls, there'll be people to help you. You give you prophecy, whatever you need there. We'll do everything we can to make it easy for you to get baptised. And Christ on top of that has said, have you got a mustard seed of faith today? Is your faith a mustard seed? Then you're ready to be baptised. Allow the Lord to show his love to you by being baptised. Let him show you of his love and mercy in your life. You'll walk out here a completely different person, but you've got to walk in faith, do the actions, and let the Lord prove himself to you. In Acts chapter 2, verse 37, it says here, Now when they were pricked in their hearts, they said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost for the promises unto you, to your children, thousand generations, he said in the Old Testament, to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourself from this untoward generation. And they that gladly received his word were baptized in the same day, added unto about 3,000 souls. Today, save yourself from this untoward generation, but more importantly, find salvation and let God's love and mercy and truth and all the wonderful things that he's got installed for your life, let him show up to you today, because he will. And all the people said, let's see over there, praise the Lord. I'll hand over to Grant.